Okay, Admiral. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I'd just like to say thank you uh, so much for joining us today. Based on uh, your experiences uh, within the intelligence and defence community, uh, but also uh, your experience within the private sector, um, could you please uh, share your thoughts on um, how nations and cultures uh, can learn from each other? And in fact, what are the benefits of having such dialogue? I spent 31 years in the U.S. Navy from 51 to 1982. I've now been in the private sector 40 years. And in that process have served on multinational corporate boards, uh, had many engagements in other countries. So my understanding and watching of cultures is influenced more by these 40 years than by the previous 31, of which 22 were in the intelligence world, because the world's changing so much, and it's constant. Um, in my first visit to Hong Kong in uh, three months, it will have been 11 years, uh, to keynote an energy conference and then have dialogue with four retired PLA officials in Shenzhen. And my direct statements then was that uh, the US and China would never be allies, that we, there was no precedent for the two, world's two largest economies to have totally different histories, totally different forms of government, totally different cultures. But that didn't mean we had to be enemies. Uh, that uh, if we managed it well, we'd be strong competitors, but it would not move from adversarial to hostilities. And I still have that view 11 years later. In light of the challenges that we face, um, what is the significance of um, maintaining and uh, building on people-to-people uh, -people exchanges? Yeah. Both countries need to focus on develop, defining and developing areas where we can cooperate. And to clearly understand areas where we can't cooperate, uh, but mm -hmm. to build fences around those to keep the adversarial from becoming hostile in the mm -hmm. process. As I think about what's possible, clearly global warming, climate change uh, is very high on that list and having endured the hottest summer on record in Austin this past mm. year, uh, it isn't hard to convince me that there is global warming. Um, the, on the other hand, as we consider how to uh, help diminish the global warming process, so much of that focus is on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And I look at so many parts of the world where fossil fuels remain absolutely critical to their economies. So I look at how do you deal with hunger? How do you deal with education? And how do you balance that off against gains, whatever gains you might make in global warming uh, and dealing with global warming, climate change? But this, I think, is clearly an area where we can cooperate. I have talked for years in speeches about threats and uh, challenges. And pandemics were always on that list, usually fourth or fifth priority. And my question always was, were the global health organizations ready to deal with a global pandemic? Mm -hmm. Sadly, we now know the answer was no, they weren't across the way. Um, great many countries have taken different approaches to dealing with it uh, with different levels of success uh, in the process. We know a lot more now than we did about developing vaccines more rapidly, about controlling movement and exposure. Uh, but the reality to me is that we're going to continue to have pandemics. Mm -hmm. Probably every year there'll be a new one that's coming. It's now part of what, as a global population, we're going to have to deal with. So 
finding ways to collaborate on how one minimizes the impact of pandemics is another area that I think we ought to focus on. Mm -hmm. Finally, if you'll forgive my falling back on my Navy experience, uh, now 40 years removed, I found that ship visits, crews getting ashore and meeting the local population was very beneficial to both sides. It let the host country see the forces as friendly rather than potentially hostile. And it educated the visitors on the cultures that they were not threatening, they were potentially friendly. So um, I'm a great believer in uh, human exchange visits uh, that they help ameliorate process. Beginning in 1979, uh, more than 100,000 Chinese students came to U.S. colleges and universities. That's declined in the last in this last decade, but that says there's a very large portion of the Chinese population which direct exposure to the U.S., its customs, its habits, its culture. From my side as a long-term uh, trustee at the California Institute of Technology, I saw how brilliant those students were. And they became uh, greatly desired by Caltech professors who wanted those Chinese students to help them in their research uh, in the process. Mm. As we all know, um, some of those stayed in the US, uh, some became college professors, particularly in the science and engineering fields. Now a great many of them have gone back to China. Uh, the number of students um, has declined partly because of US restrictions on immigration, partly on general concerns about uh, growing adversarial nature of our relations but I would like to see a resumption of that level of exchange because I think both countries benefited from it. We are edging our way into a new era. Uh, I frequently remind uh, my audiences as they worry about China's growing strength the only time we've ever ended up in a conflict, an actual fighting with China was in the Korean War. And we've now got eight, 70 years of peaceful, sometimes strained relationships along the way. So uh, conflict is not something that's automatic that's going to occur. When I came to the private sector, uh, I agreed to put together the U.S.'s first large-scale joint research venture owned by 15 computing corporations in the uh, computing and semiconductor fields to compete with Japan. Japanese had the state-of-the-art equipment for uh, manufacturing microchips and they declined to sell the state-of-the-art equipment to the U.S. So uh, at that same time, uh, the Ministry of Industry and Technology, NIDI, uh, funded a five-year program investment to give Japan the lead in computing in the years ahead. So the private sector came together in the U.S. Uh, Microelectronics, computer technology was the result of that. And um, we were successful from two dimensions. We found that pushing the frontiers of research uh, gave you a, an edge, but it was the innovation with which you used that technology that ultimately made the difference. How fast did the emerging 
research turn into usable products that were advanced beyond any others. And we simply outstripped the effort that was being funded in Japan. It led to a significant resurgence in uh, US competitiveness in this field. Now, what's the lesson I learned from all of that? Funding of research with very bright people working on it is the fundamental plank for uh, advancing your economy. But parallel to that is innovation in pulling that research out to design and manufacture a product is as important if you've got a technology lead, you want to protect it. You put it into compartmented programs. But for the vast bulk of research and activity out in the commercial world, private sector, um, trying to lock it up simply slows down your own implementation of it in the process. So I'm not a fan of moving to constrain the flow of technology used for commercial purposes. Going back to uh, the prospect of China-US uh, uh, cooperation, um, could you share your thoughts on what potential areas um, in regards to um, high-tech sectors that you maybe still see as, um, as, as on, on the table uh, where China and the US can work together but for um, mutual benefit? I have uh, watched from a distance the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, have concern about companies taking on debt that they can't service. But I'm a great believer in investment in infrastructure, uh, particularly electric power things that would improve, improve the ability to educate uh, economies across the developing world uh, in the process. I do believe this is an area where careful dialogue, looking at countries, um, to collaborating on what each could do to help those economies grow. Um, as you look at the scale of poverty still in much of the world, economic growth, sustainable economic growth is gonna be key to bringing them out of poverty. Uh, hopefully that will also lead to more stable governance uh, in many of those entities uh, where we've too often watched military stage coups take power hold on to power because it was lucrative to them personally in the process. So looking at global development activities, sorting out where can we in fact collaborate? Institutions like the World Bank and the IMF at all. I, I put that on, the, it's a harder problem, but I think it's, it's one where we can make real gains. We've already talked about climate change, global warming uh, in the process. Um, there are probably a number of other areas that I haven't given enough thought to, but I think we need a conscious effort to look at where are there problems globally, pandemics, where collaboration offers a better route for success. Uh, and not just success for China and the US, but for helping the rest of the world deal with those problems as well. I look at the amazing growth in China from 1978 on through, certainly through uh, most of this last decade, the millions of people brought from poverty into prosperity in the process. Uh, I don't think nearly enough credit is given 
to how many people have been lifted out of poverty into prosperity and contributing along the way. Um, the challenge is how do you sustain that effort? Uh, looking at what fueled that growth. Um, I'm a skeptic that state-owned enterprises led that effort. My own experience was that it was innovation in the private sector that drove much of the gains. And um, I understand that the first, my first time out in Central Park School, I got lectured on having watched, carefully studied the collapse of the Soviet Union. China was not going to make that mistake. Uh, and China is stronger than it was when it began. I had for years in my dialogues at Central Party School, advertised, caution, slow, ultimately a Hong Kong kind of solution for uh, the Taiwan challenge. That looks less promising in the current environment. But I believe as long as Taiwan does not declare independence, that the ambiguity, uh, in fact, has served all of us well. I last visited Taiwan, oh, what, approaching a decade ago, I guess now, five or six years. And I observed the period under Ma when relations with the mainland dramatically improved. And when we were there, uh, we encountered very large number of tourists from the mainland who were there to see the treasures that the KMT had taken to Taiwan from the mainland when they fled in 49. Um, that peaceful relationship, uh, broad exchange uh, with economic issues worked. But the Ma's party, uh, did not produce winning candidates uh, in the process. I'm sort of watching uh, what's the election gonna look like in Taiwan when Tsai comes to the end of her term. Uh, is there another uh, mob out there who could turn the whole nature back toward friendlier relations, stronger economic relations with the mainland? And I think the prospect of that is sufficiently promising that one should not hasten trying to integrate Taiwan by force. Um, the episode of the Ukraine has hardened US attitudes uh, that the use of force to compel Taiwan as long as Taiwan had not declared independence, would, I think, unify the U.S. public uh, in real hostility in the process. Whether or not that would impact on enough on uh, to save Taiwan is a separate issue. But what it would do was to move U.S.-China relationships to enemy as opposed to strong competitive. So, um, th this is a challenge for both sides. I don't consider some of the prominent congressional visits to Taiwan helpful, but they were playing to domestic U.S. politics in the process. And until we've run the course on this uh, movement toward uh, adversarial attitudes, not going to be easy to change. And it may be longer than that. It may be when we get past the 2024 presidential elections. To hope that we can be in a trend at that point, 
back toward developing, expanding our peaceful relationships and the areas where we collaborate. There are pretty fierce voices. You know, we call them the wolf warriors condemning the US. That gets broad in, by Chinese diplomats. That gets very broad play uh, across the media in the US. And, um, and there is an element uh, clearly hostile to China that um, noisy, if not that influential at this point in time. Uh, I think we need on both sides an effort to cool down the rhetoric and spend more time, where can we collaborate? Um, right now, the idea of ship visits probably is pretty remote. But I think over the long term, in both directions, people-to-people uh, -people exchanges help people understand different cultures, different approaches, and see them as different but not hostile. Thank you, Admiral, so much for your uh, time this morning. Thank you. Goodbye.